Good morning. I'm Sharon, one of the pastors on team at Pine Lake Covenant Church. Before we begin our service today, we invite you to try a new format to prepare our hearts for worship. You will see on the screen some scriptures and questions that'll stir your heart to be receptive to what God has for you today. You can read them aloud or simply reflect on them as together we prepare our hearts to meet God this morning. Welcome to online worship. It's good to gather together in this space. Let's join in and celebrate and remember the goodness of God together.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Jedediah. Will you join me for prayer this morning? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity to come before you and to just gather in this way. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness for another week. We're grateful, God, for all the things that you have done and for your goodness that we have experienced. Lord, we come before you in this service with hearts of longing. I pray that you would meet each person exactly where they are. We hope to encounter you and to meet you and to see you. Our heart is for you, God. Thank you for the gift of community. Thank you, Lord, for this church. We trust you with all things. We love and we care for you, God, with all of our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors on the team. It's so good to be gathered together again for worship this morning. We celebrate a lot of great things this week, like graduations and the end of school, and yet we still feel the depths of some pain as a world, as a community, as individuals. And the reality is that we serve a God and are able to worship a God that holds all of those things together. And so our prayer this morning is that God would meet you right where you are. As a church, we believe that we've been called to love God passionately, to love others deeply, and to bless the world radically. And though we've had to get creative, here's a few ways that we continue to do just that during this season of our lives. Just this past Wednesday, our care team partnered with August Moon, a Chinese restaurant right in our community, to provide over 200 meals for essential workers at Issaquah Swedish Hospital. And it's because of small yet really significant expressions of God's love that we continue to be the church in our community. Young Life Capernaum is a ministry that provides care and support and community for individuals with varying ability levels. And so as a church, we've partnered to provide care packages for each one of these families, but we need some help delivering them. So if you would be willing to come by church to pick up one of these care packages and then go drop it off at one of the family's homes, of course, while practicing good social distancing, that would be awesome. You can simply follow the link in the comment section to sign up for a time that would work for you so that together we can bless these families during this season. This week we celebrate our seniors, both our high school and college graduates. And class of 2020, you will never be forgotten for all that you have endured and yet all that we can still celebrate in each one of your lives. And so uh, take a quick look at this video of the ways that we can celebrate and send our seniors into new seasons and new opportunities. Take a look.
morning, I'm Pastor Nancy Kairos Kids. It's time to gather together and share in our rock wall tradition. So come a little bit closer to the screen. Make sure you have your celebration jar, your rock wall, your memento container, so we can recognize our God sightings. We add our mementos, our rocks, each week when we're gathered together, when we have our Bible, when we share our remember verse, when we see God active in our life with our God sighting. So I'm going to add some rocks for us this week. I'm going to add some for all of you who have your Bibles, and I'm going to add some for our June birthdays. Gabrielle, Esme, Kai, you are God sightings to me, and we're so grateful to have you as part of our Kairos Kids. One of the other ways we celebrate is with a remember verse, and we have a new one that we'll have with us for this series. So let's take a look together and let's say this out loud. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Matthew six thirty three. This Friday is Juneteenth. And we're going to have a special opportunity to stand in solidarity with other covenant churches against issues of systemic racism and injustice in something called a march to surrender. This is a vision that came from the hearts of Pastor Mike and Pastor Kim from Radiant Covenant Church. And they asked our Pacific Northwest Conference, and there's going to be churches all over our conference that are going to come together to march together. This march is going to be starting in downtown Renton, and we'll go about for a mile, and then we're going to have a time of prayer and lament and asking God to move and to come and heal our land and to heal us from all the things of injustice. We're going to be gathering together and walking. We will be practicing uh, safe guidelines. Everyone will be wearing masks and trying to social distance as much as possible. We're gonna be caravanning uh, from the church, from PLCC to Renton. We're gonna meet at 12.30 on Friday. And if you're interested, just register online at www.plcc.org backslash March. You'll see the link in the comments below. We hope that you can make it out. Let's stand in solidarity against injustice. Let's ask God to come and heal our nation as he changes our hearts so that we can step in and be the people of God and bring change to this world. I have a great privilege of praying or leading us in prayer this morning for our nation and for, um, first of all, for the uh, racial tensions and uh, strife. We're going to pray for God's peace there and justice. And also we're going to pray for those who are serving in our police departments. And we're gonna, I, wanna, I wanna make the case that we can do that together, that the church is uniquely positioned to pray for both of those. It's a both and for us. I wanna begin by reading a comment from uh, Dr. Uh, John Perkins, who is a uh, African-American. He, he's, uh, he, he's been around a long time. He has a great voice for us to hear. And he says that there is no institution more equipped and capable of bringing transformation to the cause of reconciliation than the church. But we have some hard work to do. And yes, indeed, we have hard work to do. And I want to encourage you to listen deeply to the voice of those who are uh, the African, our African-American brothers and sisters and uh, the, the voices of racism they've experienced. We don't get to call racism what it is. They do. And listen to them. Listen to them deeply. And allow the Holy Spirit to probe your heart to see if there's any darkness in there that needs to be cleansed. Uh, that's my first encouragement. We're going to pray for that. And then as this, uh, as this cause uh, of reconciliation or racial righteousness has uh, come forth and our nation is is crying out for change the police departments those who work in the police departments men and women are under a ton of pressure right now and they're working long hours and they're in places that are pretty dangerous and they're oftentimes not appreciated and they're very discouraged is what i'm getting so we want to pray for them now we need to be clear that the Bible would teach us that they are there because God has chosen those authorities as a, as a gift to uh, society. That, uh, what, and what a gift it is. 
they, they keep the peace and they keep, they keep justice, really. But with any good gift, there is corruption of the gift. And that is true of anything you can name in this world. Uh, anything good is potentially corruptible. So we're going to pray for that as well. We acknowledge that. So what I want to do is I'm going to be uh, mostly reading a prayer because I want to make sure I get it right. This is important. And I want you to uh, just pray with me. Enter in as best you can with your own hearts. Uh, let's pray together. First of all, Lord God, we pray for your, your kingdom, your justice, and your peace to come on earth as it is in heaven. Heal this nation, O oh Lord, of its gaping wound. Cause us all to do the hard work of listening, of going deeper into our own hearts, to look at where our assumptions are, to look at the things that have influenced us over time, the unchallenged areas of our hearts that need to be challenged. And may we listen well to your spirit and to the voices of those around us who have been hurt. And then, Lord, secondly, we pray for those who serve in police work, for men and women who are working long hours and feel discouraged, and we want to lift them up to you. God, we pray that you would give them energy for their calling and that you would protect them. And Lord, wherever reform is needed, wherever it's needed, Lord, we pray for that. And we pray that it would be done with the greatest wisdom possible. We pray against injustice, and we pray for those who are called to enforce justice. May it all be done, Lord Jesus, according to your will. In your name we pray, amen. As we come to a time of giving this morning, and you make some of your decisions about giving, I wanna thank you for your generous support to the gospel work through this church. You know, it was your generosity that allowed us through the CARE Fund to bless the workers at Swedish Hospital this past week. And those same generous hearts contribute to the ongoing work of this church in our community and the world beyond. There are two ways you can give. You can give online at plcc.org slash give, or you can text any amount securely to this number, 725 444 9494. And of course, if you prefer to send a check, the church will pick that up in the mail this week as well. As we prepare to give, please pray the words that are going to be on the screen. Let's pray together. God, receive these gifts as worship this morning, for all we have is yours. Amen. Good morning. My name is Anna Callahan. Today's reading is from Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 through 34. We will be reading from the New International Version. Please follow along as the text is presented on the screen. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate fa father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my dis disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Good morning. Uh, I'm assuming that you have all uh, read a letter or an email that says that I will be retiring after 25 years. Um, 
of doing what I'm doing now, basically, and being a pastor of a church and uh, looking for that, whatever that next thing Jesus has for me in my life. And Patty and I made this decision uh, quite a while ago, but uh, I told the leadership team uh, late last summer that I would be concluding in June. And um, then when the coronavirus came, we delayed that a bit, but we'll be here through the end of July. I've got seven uh, Sundays left, today being the first of those. And the thing I want to say is that uh, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss being a pastor. And yet it seems like this is the right time for us to do this. And so to this series, uh, it's called The Main Thing. And when I came here, uh, I put out this statement that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And I want to just kind of conclude here after eight years by uh, focusing back in on the main thing and, and work my own life story a little bit into that because it's, it's kind of how I interpret my life story through uh, the person of Jesus Christ, who is the main thing. He is the North Star. The one star in the sky that is, is fixed, the pole star that we can navigate our lives by, the one the Bible points to. And I, I would just love to do that as clearly and deeply as I can in these last weeks that we have together. And hopefully, too, we'll have uh, chances to say goodbye safely and appropriately uh, between now and the end of July. So there you go. And we're going to start out today with uh, Luke 14. Next week, we're going to be in Luke 15. And this is all part of a, a passage in, in uh, or a section in Luke that starts in chapter 9, verse 53, where it says that Jesus resolutely set his face for Jerusalem. So we're walking towards the cross now with Jesus, and he's teaching his followers as he goes. And the teaching today is a very hard teaching, as we'll see, uh, as you've heard already. And the teaching next week is a very beautiful teaching, and we need both. So uh, if this is really hard for you today, well, uh, wait till next week. But that is who Jesus is. He's bigger than whatever our thoughts are of him. And it, our culture would tell us that the hardest thing in life is to be yourself in the midst of a world or a family system or uh, other uh, group pressure that wants to conform you into something else. Be yourself, and that's going to take courage and strength and inner fortitude. And there is some truth there, but I want to suggest to you, and I think it, I'll make the case today uh, pretty clearly, that by far the hardest thing in life is following Jesus Christ. It is way harder than being yourself in the way that the world is saying that. And not just harder, but way better in, in the end. So uh, let's get into the, this passage. I want to uh, give you the outline. that we're, Jesus gives three ultimatums, and we're going to take each one. The first one is to hate your family. Say so that's that causes us to perk up. What does that mean? The second one is to carry your cross. And the third one is to give it all up. So three ultimatums that Jesus gives us in this passage. Um, I want to begin, though, before we get to the, the hating uh, section there, uh, verse 26, I want to just give a little context for this passage. And that is that uh, it's, the, I'll give biblically some context and maybe personally a little bit of context from, from my, my own life. So in this, in this section of scripture, and, and you'll see this elsewhere, but Jesus is with the 12 and he's teaching them about what it means uh, to go to the cross. That's, that's kind of the theme that dominates this whole, from, from chapter nine up through his entry into Jerusalem. And, um, and yet there's, there's another group. There's the 12, the 12 disciples, but there's also this bigger group called the crowd. And it just seems like every so often, and I could point to these places, but we'll just 
I think you'll recognize it when I say it. Every so often, Jesus will say something that is so uh, outlandish or hard that it just sort of thins the crowd out. It's almost like he's testing to see if they really want to follow him. And he's doing that here. It's almost like Jesus is more concerned about the quality of his followers than the quantity, even though he loves everybody. But th this section would lead you to conclude that. So uh, that's where we're going to be today. But for my own life, personally, the context of this passage is I want to refer to a, uh, a three-year period in my life, roughly a three-year period, between when I gave up my atheist, uh, you know, that was my identity as an atheist, and when I actually became a follower of Jesus Christ, there was a period there where I was uh, in the crowd, I was not really a disciple. I wasn't trying to be a disciple, but I kind of was attracted to Jesus, which is easy to do. It's easy to be attracted to him. He's fascinating. But um, it, was, it was really hard for me to, uh, to think about throwing it all, all in with him, and I'll touch on some of that today as we go through this passage. It's also an important passage for me because when I did my, uh, my doctoral work uh, in men's discipleship. This was the launching uh, pad for my, my work, and, and um, I, I would present this to men as that place of, hey, do you want to really follow Jesus, or do you want to be with the crowd? So it's kind of that sorting out place. Uh, okay, let's get into the text of what, what does it mean to uh, hate your family? And uh, when you hear that, you think, oh, gee, what's, uh, what, where's this going to go? And a lot of people who really don't like Jesus will use this as a justification for not liking him. And uh, I think you have to get a little bit beyond that, at least. I mean, the, the Old Testament's pretty clear. One of the Ten Commandments is to love your mother and father. So we have to question uh, that simple or simplistic interpretation. But let me deepen our understanding just a bit. And one thing is, if it offends us to hear Jesus say that you must hate all those family members that he lists, it would have been even more startling to a traditional culture where not just nuclear family, but extended family was uh, your primary source of loyalty and identity and belonging. I mean, you were, you would never do anything in that culture that would disgrace or shame your family. I mean, it, it, there was such social taboos against that to marry the wrong person, to have the wrong kind of job, uh, to say something that would bring shame on your family. There's so much pressure against that. And so for, for Jesus to speak this into that traditional culture, traditional Jewish culture would have been extremely startling to them. So what is he saying here? Uh, and it might be helpful. Well, first of all, obviously, I'd say obviously, it's hyperbole. People use hyperbole. They overstate things in order to make a point. And if you take it literally, you're going to miss the point. Uh, when people say take scripture literally, if you take it literally here, you're going to totally miss what Jesus is saying. Taking it literally means to understand what he's saying. And what he's saying the point of, of the hyperbole is uh, something that he that's really really important. It's one of those main things in Scripture. But let me let me make something clear first. In the Semitic and Semitic languages, which Hebrew is one, you will find this sometimes, maybe often, where there's two usages of the word hatred. There, there's the active usage, which is how we understand hatred. Is that strongly passionate, negative feeling towards someone. Or it, there's comparative hatred, where you use it in, in speech to illustrate not that uh, uh, active hatred, but, but in, in compared to something else, it's, it's like you would hate them. So in the, in the story of Jacob in Genesis chapter 29, at least some translations translate that, that Jacob loved Rachel, but hated Leah. He had two wives. An unfortunate move on his part, I would say. But uh, even God can even use that. Anyway, uh, he, he loved Rachel 
and hated Leah. He didn't really hate Leah. I mean, there's illustrations of his love for Leah elsewhere. But in comparison to Rachel, it was like hatred. It, it, his love for Rachel, he was so head over heels for Rachel that Leah, the love for Leah was, was far less. So that, that's really how we should understand it. Um, and hopefully that, that I mean, it, I think it really becomes clear. It makes sense of how it fits in with the rest of what Jesus is saying. Uh, for me personally, um, on, on this one, in those three years where I was hesitating to go all in with Jesus, the, the reason was, a lot of the reason was because of my family. And I, I loved my family. Uh, I mean, we had our issues, but it was the primary source of my uh, identity and, uh, I guess, belonging in that I really cared what they thought about me, particularly my parents as I was in my mid to my mid twenties or early twenties, those years, as I was becoming an adult, I really cared what my parents thought about me. And I grew up in a home where the value of just being reasonable and not being extreme and uh, being in control of yourself and being moderate and be, I tell you what, being religiously weird would have not been part of our family. You can go to church and have that be a part of your life, but boy, don't don't just go all in. That's uh, that's that's kind of something that weird people do. So that's I, I'm just saying that's kind of what kept me in this place of hesitating to go all in with Jesus. Uh, now the irony of that is, and this is, this is really important I think to hear, is that once I did commit my life to Christ, when I made Jesus my first love, when he became my North Star, my main thing in life, I became a better son to my parents. I, I love them with a deeper love that I had access to now. I prayed for them like I'd never prayed for them before. I was more sensitive to them, wanting things for them that I hadn't wanted before. I was a better son. And our relationship actually, uh, eventually anyway, got better, closer. And they were attracted to Christ through me. And other siblings in, in my family could say the same thing about and let's just say, you know, today, today's flag day, which is we don't celebrate that much anymore. Let's just say you love the flag. Some of you do. And, you know, if you love this nation more than you love Jesus, you'll love it better if you put Jesus first. Yeah, it's just the way it works. Same with your spouse. If your spouse, if you love your spouse more than Jesus, if you love Jesus, you'll love your spouse better. I mean, it's, it's just, you have access to this love that you didn't have access to before. And it changes you and it makes you better. And the same thing with parenting, loving a child more than you love God, you love God more, you're going to be a better parent. With, with money, you love money more than God, you love God more, you'll manage your money better. It's, it's just putting him first and letting things get sorted out from him keeping the main thing the main thing. It, it's just this absolutely principle of life. And that's what Jesus, Jesus is getting at here. He uses the language of hatred to get our attention, but it's really about love and putting our loves first. All right, second thing. So we've got the, the hating our family. Then we have to go to the carrying our cross. You must carry your cross. If you're gonna follow me, that's the second ultimatum. And to carry your cross, if we, we would hear that maybe in kind of a way like, uh, well, I have to put up with this situation or this person, it's hard, I'm carrying my cross, I'm taking up my cross, it's my cross to bear, that kind of thing. That is absolutely not what they would have heard in the setting there as Jesus was speaking into that crowd. What they would have heard and what we have kind of lost is that he, what Jesus is saying to them is that they must take up the persona or the identity or go in the place of a criminal, 
a criminal. When they hear cross, that's, that's the only word association with the word cross in the first century. Criminal. Those are the only people that die on a cross are criminals. So, you know, maybe, maybe for us, if, if to, to get us to think differently would be if I were to say, take up your electric chair or go sit in your electric chair or whatever. I mean, it's that kind of jarring statement that Jesus is making to them. Um, and he wants them to know this, there's a huge cost here. This is the, the cost is absolutely huge. It will mean you are going to be ridiculed. It means that you're going to be mocked. It means that your ego is going to be squelched. It means that, yes, it's something like death. It's a huge cost to follow him. Not, not a little cost, an absolutely huge cost to follow him. And now he wants to make it clear in this passage that the, it's really important that you count the costs before you enter in. And so he gives two metaphors, one from the construction industry and one from the military. And the construction one, he goes first and he says that if you start to build a tower and you build a foundation and you get halfway built, and of course the tower is something that you can see from miles around or whatever. Uh, if you don't finish it, people are gonna laugh at you or ridicule you uh, and you know, maybe call you a quitter or whatever. So just a, an illustration from um, kind of the area where I grew up, uh, at least it's on the way to Aberdeen and in this place called Sats up there, there's this you know, tower, I'll put it up on the screen there for you, but the, the, the Twin Towers, um, for those of you who are Lord of the Ring fans, this is a whole different definition of Twin Towers, but these were built back in the late 70s and they were to be this place where nuclear power was going to be um, generated and billions of dollars went into it and it was put together by the Washington Public Power Supply System. And that um, those letters came to be known as whoops. They had a big whoops because of they ran out of money and they ran out of political will. And it became kind of what you'd call a boondoggle. And they were laughed at and ridiculed. So there's an illustration. Now, what about the military? Well. It, Jesus says, if you're a king going out to battle and you realize you've only got half the force of the enemy, you want to sue for peace, don't be stupid. And so it, these illustrations are meant to encourage us to count the costs, to make sure we understand what we're getting into. And they're basically saying, this is what I was hearing in that three-year period of my life, it's all or nothing. That you can't, you can't don't go halfway. If you go halfway, you're going to look like the, the unfinished project there in Satsa. It, it is, uh, it, it is the illustration from that many have used. I'll just bring it up one more time: is when you eat the breakfast of of bacon and eggs or ham and eggs, the chicken has made a contribution, but the pig hasn't paid the ultimate price to be in that meal. And Jesus is asking us to play the role of, of the pig, not the chicken here. It's an all-in deal to be his disciple. Now, so the cost is high. Count the cost. Uh, there's a question that comes up to us, and I, I want to bring it up right now. And, and it has to do with where, where you are in that. I want you to think about how, how are you in or not, basically. Half, halfway is not going to do it. And if you're in, you have had this, you know, people will say it differently, but something like this where the Holy Spirit will enlighten your heart in such a way that when you see Jesus, now remember Jesus is telling us to do something here or telling his followers to do something that he is actually going to do. And that is carry a cross. It's, it's, it's there, he's, it's in his near future. And when you see Jesus on the cross and you see the hatred of the world around him, for him, and the ridicule and the mocking and the bullying and all those things, the spitting and all those things that were part of that hatred, you see the measure of that hatred of the world. And then you see it not as a measure of the hatred of the world, but a measure of the love of Jesus for the world. And the Holy Spirit does that new math in your heart, that recalculating in your heart. And you say, oh my, oh, I see. 
That's how much God loves me. Yeah, and then that, only the Holy Spirit can do that. That is, that is his work. It is a spiritually discerned thing. You cannot do that by taking a class. You cannot do that by me explaining it to you. It's only by the Holy Spirit of God who is alive right now, who's here right now. Listen to him. Okay, the third thing then, we have the hating of your family, we have the carrying of your cross, and then we have it, it, give it all up, basically. And the picture I'm going to use for give it all up is from Mark chapter 12. It's the widow who brings her two small coins and puts them in the offering box. And Jesus contrasts her offering with that of a rich man who put much more in, but he says that she actually put everything she had in. She, as it were, put her whole self in, and the rich man didn't do that. So putting your whole self in with Jesus, he's saying the same thing again here. Uh, this is, yeah, this is, the cost is really high here. And the question would come up, I think in all of our hearts, it should at least, if we're, if, even if we're just consumers, like, why would anyone do this? If that's the cost, what, what, why would anyone you know, hate their family, even if it's with a comparative hate? What, why would anyone want to carry a cross which is going to bring ridicule and, and death to ego and maybe deaths and suffering? And I mean, it's just, why would anybody want to do this? I mean, what's, where's the, what's the incentive for all this? And, uh, you know, in my life, just to go back to that story, when I finally did give my life to Christ, it was, uh, I t I'll just be honest, it was more like, I'm out of gas here. I'm, I'm empty. I'm exhausted. I don't have any better options. I don't know where else I can go. I'm, you know, take me, Jesus. <laughs> I'm, I don't have, I don't know where else to do, to, what else to do. That was my story. But as I went along in, in following Christ, uh, there are other stories that can be told. And one of them that's really beautiful is in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 13, verse 44. It's a, it's a one verse parable of uh, the, what the kingdom of God is like. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a field that has treasure hidden in it. So that's what the kingdom of God is like. And a man comes out finds the treasure, and then hides it again, goes back home, sells everything he has, and comes back and he buys the field. That's what the kingdom of God is like. And if we were to interview that man, what he would say, I think, based on what Jesus said about him, is, you know, why did you do that? Why did you, I mean, the cost was high, everything, right? Why would you do that? And the man would say, I got such a deal. I traded up, not down. I, I, I did a cost benefit analysis and it's not even close. What I got is worth way more than what I gave up. Trading up, it's all about trading up. That's what he would say. That is the kingdom of God. And what I'd like to do right now is lead us in a prayer. And I'm gonna ask you to uh, close your eyes if you would. I know, you know you're in your, in your uh, place there watching this, but I, if you would close your eyes and I'm gonna ask you to use the imagination that God gave you. And uh, with eyes closed, it'll be helpful. So uh, with your eyes closed, picture Jesus. Let's, let's just together now, we're gonna walk through this. Picture Jesus, he's on the cross. He's carried his cross, and now he's on the cross. And people are saying things to him. They're, um, they're laughing at him. They're mocking him. They're shaming him publicly. He's naked. He's bloodied. He's bruised. He's been bullied. He's dying. He's taken on the persona of a criminal, a common criminal. And just, just really get your imagination to picture the hate that is all around that scene. It is hate. 
for Jesus, by many at least. Active hate, the world had for him at that time. Feel the weight of that. And now let's feel the weight of what the Spirit might be saying to us. And let's allow the Spirit to show us not just the measure of that hate, but how the measure of that hate shows us the immense love of Jesus for that world. He didn't have to do this. <laughs> I mean, he spent all this time walking towards Jerusalem of his own free will, knowing that this was going to happen. He's there because he loves the world. And he loves the world, and he can see down through history, and he can see the divisions and the pain that are part of our culture today. And he loves that world. And he wants that world to be reconciled to himself and to each other. He loves that world that is in such pain, that is divided. And he loves us who are in pain and who have darkness in our hearts, things that aren't lovable in us. He loves us from that place. And we are in need of his healing. This world is in need of his healing. We pray for that. Lord Jesus, come and heal us. In your name we pray. Amen. every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
As we go into this week, let's just say that Jesus Christ is the main thing, that whatever it costs to have Jesus in your life, it's worth it. And the Bible says in Colossians that he holds all things together. He holds this world together that seems to be falling apart. And uh, a promise for us is that he holds us together when we seem to be falling apart. Jesus Christ, the main thing, go in his name, go in the power, the reality of Jesus Christ into this week. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning. We're glad that we could be together. We invite you to join us in Encore right after this service. We, if, even if you can just stay for five minutes and show up and be seen and connect with others, it's good to be together. And Pastor Mark and Patty will be on that con Zoom call to answer your questions and just be with you this morning. So I invite you, join us in Encore.